Perfect. So everybody, welcome to the Sick of Plastic Conversations. My name is Lindsay and I'm the communications lead for the Sick of Plastic Ireland campaign. Um, every Friday, we're going to be joined with somebody who, like you and like us, is absolutely sick of plastic and who are doing something about it. Today, we're lucky to be joined with artist and inspired change maker, Claire McCluskey. Hi, Claire. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you have any comments or questions, please pop them down and we'll answer them as best we can. Um, if you'd like to get involved in our campaigns, all you have to do is look up our Instagram account. All details are there or follow our website on voiceireland.org. Just look for the Sick of Plastic logo. Um, so Claire, you're a visual artist from Monaghan. Uh, you're known for so many things. You're a great <laughs> author, you're sea diaries, uh, you're a sailor. A mechanical engineer. I mean, the list goes on. <laughs> I'll take it. Why not? <laughs> um, and I want to talk to you about your recent trip, especially upon, upon, aboard the X expedition. Sure, yeah. But before we do that, will you tell us a little bit about yourself and when you became sick of plastic? Yeah. Well, I suppose it's it's kind of it's all tied up in that. Um, uh, when I kind of first became um, involved in sailing, and it was a sort. of a few, like you mentioned my sea diaries there a few years ago myself and my partner um embarked on this uh transatlantic sailing voyage and that was that was pretty uh, it was quite a wild kind of adventurous thing to do at the time uh resulting in all sorts of crazy mishaps including the mechanicing story but that's for a different day maybe um but the um it was then that I kind of started to really notice plastic like and actually even on that voyage I remember we were like in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you know, like we sail completely offshore from Ireland kind of across to the, the Caribbean. And like we're in the middle of nowhere, essentially, like complete big blue wilderness. And then you sort of start seeing plastic pieces kind of floating past every once in a while. And today you might see something over there. You might see like five things. Over there. Like it starts, it just, it comes up a lot, you know. And that. I suppose without any, with the absence of any other uh, human presence, maybe it sticks out so much more than in our general daily lives, you know. So I started to notice it then and be like, this really feels like odd, you know, it shouldn't really be there. And I think until that point, I hadn't really thought about it that much, you know. And straight after that whole traveling voyage and we settled back into real life again, which was interesting um i was living with a friend who is very active in the uh, he's very environmentally literate he works in that field you know and he was a great just even observing his way of responding to the world was really influential i think and and you know he he was him and his uh, girlfriend they they were the ones that introduced me to the concept of you know plastic free july kind of you know that was the first sort of thing you know making a con you know making a conscious uh, decision to recognize the plastic that you have coming into your life and auditing that. And it just suddenly starts seeing it everywhere, you know? So um, yeah. for, it, it went from being that thing where when you strip back all of the kind of social cues and it stands out when you kind of take that lens as it were back into real life again, and you go to the supermarket, it's like an overwhelming, you know, assault nearly like everything is just plastic, plastic, plastic. You know, and I, and I think there's, I kind of am seeing it, different people at different stages and even witnessing my own shift along that kind of wakening up to, to seeing that. It's so easy to not see it, I think, if you're, if you're not paying attention to it. But once you start to let to, your eyes open to it, it just is everywhere, you know. So, so it was a, it was a increasing journey as it were um yeah. where I was just and, and you start getting really annoyed by it then you know and it starts becoming mm. really like you know yourself you know it's just it's hard to avoid it it's this really complicated gymnastics then of trying not to let it into your life or trying to say no to it you know yeah I, I, it's interesting what you said there about wearing a lens once you put that plastic lens onto your the filter onto your eyes yeah. you can't unsee it that's yeah. it you see it in your bathroom you see it in your kitchen you see it wherever you go yeah yeah exactly yeah um and so then uh when i saw the ad for the x expedition trip i was well i was really excited to get back out to sea again if i'm being honest i was really like you know it was a really incredible incredible experience and prior to that trip uh the first time when we went to sea i had no prior sailing experience or i wasn't a sea um a seafaring kind of a sort at all you know like monhan's a landlocked county like i live in dublin now but uh, it yeah was very much a new thing for me so I was kind of dying to get back out again to 
because it's a very interesting space that offshore ocean open ocean it's just a really weird place to be and I love it I just find it really suited me so um so when I saw the chance to get back out to sea and thinking about it this time specifically in terms of the kind of plastic problem I was really uh keen to get involved in in that initiative uh the expedition project you know so that was a really great um yeah, it just seemed like the right time, the right thing for me to do at that time. And so I was delighted to be selected um, to, to join on uh, leg eight. So, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, back, the background of the XX project, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm just going to say to everybody, thanks for joining. And I've got, there's so many people joining, Claire. This is fantastic. Oh, um, Hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah, everyone. I'm Lindsay and I'm joined here today by Claire McCluskey. And we're talking about her epic journeys on sea and on land. Uh, and her fight against plastic and we're just about to get into the X expedition so it's a project that was set up in the UK and basically it's a ship that's sailing around the world a boat and it's to tackle the devastating environmental and health impacts of single-use plastic microplastics and toxins in the world's oceans but Claire yeah will you tell us all about it please and um, what's it doing its mantra yeah yeah so the kind of the I think the core the core um uh what you like motto I suppose for the best word for it they they kind of the the headline for the X expedition project is to kind of make the visible visible you know and it's it's around yeah. this um uh it's, it's around microplastics in the world's oceans so they have they're an incredible organization just the kind of the sheer will and energy behind them as a team like it's a very small crew who organized it it was started by um this woman called Emily Penn in the UK and so they have done previous voyages where they um, have gone across uh, the Atlantic and the Pacific and a few other locations like that over the last couple of years, taking out a team of women who are not necessarily scientists um, from all different disciplines. Um, the idea being that you bring together all sorts of people who are interested in the problem, but who have different ways of knowing the world or different languages through which they can communicate or come at this problem um, so that you get them all in a boat they see the problem they witness it the kind of the real real life gritty reality of it and then they talk about it and then everybody coming from such different areas then can certainly spark off a whole new ways of thinking about it you know so it's a really it's just a really cool model i think i think it's really admirable sort of what they put together so the around the world mission then is um it was like a hugely ambitious it, it is it's incredible like they just decided let's do full way around the world you know 300 women one boat two years and uh and yeah they set off then i think it was last november they departed from the uk um so the 300 women are 10 on each leg 30 legs not all at once obviously um, mm. so uh yeah so they um they have broken up the the round the world journey into different kind of segments going from um uh, it was the UK to the Caribbean and then various legs around there. So I was on leg eight. Um, so I was part of the team that sailed from the Galapagos Islands uh, to Easter Island, covering uh, 2009 nautical miles of the Pacific Ocean. So it was a, a long journey. It was two weeks we were at sea for, which was great. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, what they're doing that I suppose is unique in terms of this kind of research um, there's quite a lot in the field um, around microplastic research and uh, they have one of the leading scientists in that area, Dr. Winnie Courtney Jones, acting as their science lead. So she designed the, the whole program for X Expedition. Um, and they are researching the, um, the kind of the, it, so basically it's the first global study of this kind where it's going the whole way around the world and, you know, using uh, data that, you know the same methods the whole around so you can compare so they want to compare the, the kind of the variances in quantities of plastic in the different oceans how the different polymer types are distributed different differently as well and what effects that the ocean currents would have on the distribution of, of the um, microplastics as well and um, so yeah it's, it's pretty exciting the kind of the, the premise of the of the whole project and there's a whole host of other um uh, kind of additional um data that they're gathering as well for different institutions that's been developed with kind of the University of Plymouth is where uh, Dr. Courtney Jones is working from and she's also mm -hmm. I think been collaborating with the University of Chicago Dr. Jenna Jambach over there and a few other kind of key players in the field so it's quite like cutting edge um, science uh, yeah. that they're that they're contributing to as well. 
I noticed as well on their Instagram page, the X Expedition uh, Instagram page, anyone who's interested, they have a hashtag Science Thursday where mm-hmm. the science lead, Wayne e. Jones, will answer any questions that anyone has. And that's brilliant. So it's, it's opening up that conversation to everybody. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's so, and that's the, it's so accessible, really, the program, you know, because it's quite, it's mm-hmm. such technical, um, very, um, like, when you drill down, like, I'm not a scientist, you know, like, and not many people on the boat. There were a few actually on our leg. Like I said, everybody's coming from different uh, disciplines and different backgrounds and stuff. But mm. the way that they bring people in and make it so inclusive, it's all about communicating to people. Like Because if you have all the science and this knowledge, but you're not actually, it's not landing with people, uh, it's not going to make a difference in that. You know, it's how do we translate the... Yeah. I think the really important thing is taking what they're learning in the uh, in terms of the science, but then putting that in terms that we can then understand and integrate into our own lives and what that means to find microplastics in the middle of the ocean where nobody goes you know what does that actually mean for us as in the bigger picture you know um and it would be quite scary you know like to find like like i said uh we we did the leg in the pacific ocean and it was so remote um we saw one boat one other boat in the entire two weeks you know and and no other sense of land no other boats there was nothing else around at all no planes overhead you know we were completely in the middle of you know nowhere with nobody else around and we were still finding microplastic particles in our in our trawls and things you know so it's quite sobering really you know yeah it was it was it was kind of wild um yeah can you tell us actually just so i can envisage what was it like a day-to-day on the boat and what was it like with with you know 30 other women sharing that space and you all have something in common you know yeah yeah it's funny like that question that kind of the all-female crew gets asked a bit where people are like what was it like and it was really very similar to (laughs) any kind of mixed crews of it It was but uh it was just a lot of a lot of good crack really like it was actually really fun yeah just the, the, the sense of camaraderie i think when you're a crew like that and completely on your own in a boat, you know, very reliant on yourselves and nobody else. Mm-hmm. You, it's a really, it's a very, a very strong bonds get forged very quickly. People become very caring and, and aware of, because people are having a hard time as well, you know, like, so to give you a picture mm-hmm. where we're, we set out on the boat and it's a 73 foot sailing boat. So it's probably about the size of a really small apartment and um, <laughs> and there's 14 people living there all sleeping in the same room <laughs> in bunk beds um at the bow of the boat and uh so we're sailing upwind so that means the wind was kind of coming against the nose of the boat and that means that the boat then leans 15 degrees to the side uh for two weeks and it's kind of like crashing through the waves i guess so you're trying to do everything at like a slant you know so you're like walking around and like having a pee and everything like that it's just really that much more interesting shall we say um, um, but then there's um because the boat's going 24 hours a day you know you have to mm-hmm. uh, be sailing at all times so someone always always has to be on the, the steering wheel uh looking at the radio all that kind of stuff um looking at the sails and all this. so we had yeah. uh, quite a strict watch system um like a schedule where um we were on watch teams um and we would do i'm trying to remember now it was we would do four hours on and eight hours off and it would kind of go like that in a cycle of the day so every the way that it was worked was every day you would be doing a different uh task so this morning like one morning my team would be on breakfast and we'd be doing that watch system where we get breakfast or um sorry getting lunch ready and stuff like that and then the next day we'd be on the team that would be cleaning up lunch and then the next day you know so it rotated every day like that and then in the middle of the day we would have a few hours dedicated to the science uh, collection the kind of da- gathering of the the data and stuff like that um mm-hmm. which was which was so great great as well to be kind of there with winnie um who's like just this very accomplished scientist and this is her like speciality as well you know this this field so mm-hmm. she was talking us through all of the the techniques that we were doing and we were very hands-on you know we were like launching all of the equipment and, and things like that um, and yeah. under her guidance and like gathering all the data samples and packaging them up and labeling them for uh, sending back to the lab and and uh, all yeah. that kind of stuff um, wow and i'd say there was a lot of equipment on board was there yeah we had some amazing equipment so the kind of the difference um uh shall we say experiments or or the techniques that we were using and we were so we were there to kind of look at the the 
the surface water and, and see what we could get from the surface and then subsurface just below the kind of into the water column but like still within like 50 I think it was 50 meters of the depth and uh, we used uh, we had this really great piece of kit called a manta trawl which every day we would uh, lower over the side of the boat um, and it is called a manta trawl because it looks like a kind of a large um, manta ray it's designed around that kind of uh, uh, that format it, and it has a big kind of gaping mm. kind of mouth at, at the front of it and a net then at the back so the water streams through its kind of design means that it will skate along the top of the water and gather uh, all of the kind of sediment from the top and catch it in this net so then after a half an hour we we haul that back in it's a really it's quite a complicated maneuver it takes about five of us to like lower and ropes and the kind of launching over the side you know it's quite physical and demanding kind of what you have to be very careful with it and stuff and then we would uh, collect the net from that and filter the, the sediment inside through these different sized filters to grade it by size. And um, that was that was incredible, actually, because you kind of I have some really interesting like macro photographs. I had a little like kind of lens I could clip onto my phone of all of the gunk that you get in that trawl. It's just the life that's living on the top of the sea like you don't really when you look out at the kind of the clear water, it looks so beautiful and clear and, and, and glassy and, and clean, you know, and then there's actually all of this like healthy um, plankton kind of goo, you know, it's, it's really, and just these really fantastic looking creatures. I have some pictures on my Instagram, actually, I think if anyone wants to check that out later. Um, so this was all coming in, in these nets, you know, uh, mm -hmm. And then we have to like sort through and pick through and you're finding these tiny little see-through crabs and stuff. And then you're finding like a little bit of microplastic kind of smushed in, wrapped around these little things, you know? So that was quite sobering as well. Okay. Your, your face is just, yeah, it's just really like <laughs> on that kind of level. Was there, was there ever a day where you didn't find plastic or was it every single day? No, no. At the, at the beginning, there were definitely a few days that we didn't find um that now could have been because um, of where we were, maybe. Um, so basically, we were headed towards the South Pacific Gyre. Uh, mm. The gyres are the kind of, they're sort of natural convergence zones of like uh, wind and uh, uh, currents, sea currents and stuff. So huge, um, the kind of center point of the kind of the huge weather patterns. Um, uh, that occur in the oceans and they become natural accumulation zones uh, where debris seems to be brought into and then it can't once it kind of spirals in there it can't get out again so um they that's part of what the x expedition uh, survey is looking into as well as how do these uh, gyres and currents affect the distribution of plastics and um, when we left the galapagos we weren't quite in the gyre we were finding slightly less the first few days we didn't find anything really in the trolls i don't think for the first maybe day or so that could have also have been as well due to the sea state where it was a bit too rough to um for the troll to properly um catch and like settle onto the surface of the water so when the water's a, a bit choppier it's a bit more agitated it's harder for it to get um a lot of sediment and the water kind of calmed down the closer we got to the gyre so we did start to see an increase in the amount of particles that we were gathering um as we got closer and closer to Easter Island. I think we were, we found maybe up to like five times as many particles when we were within the gyre itself or where, wow. where we expected the gyre. What, Cause you can never, it's the gyre itself is a moving phenomenon. So you can never really tell if you're inside it or not. It's, a, um, you can't, you just kind of can know because the, the, it gets calmer and there's more, more plastic pieces essentially, I suppose that kind of gives it, gives it away. So, um, yeah, we the first two days out, we didn't really find anything, but then we, we gradually found more and more and more, and we were getting steadily increasing as we got closer to Easter Island. And now Easter Island itself as well is located pretty much within the, the Gyre region. And the plastic particles that we found on the beaches there was just jaw-dropping. Like it, there was, for such a small island, it was just constantly getting barrages of, of like really small partic uh, particles and yeah it's um uh, they're really seeing it firsthand and i i kind of wrote about it a little bit in the in an article recently for the irish times the the sort of the thing that they're dealing with like they can't turn away from this issue and um, mm. their beaches are just covered like a 
you know, a kind of a thin layer. I thought I was walking on stones at first. And then you start to, you look down and you start to see that it's all plastic pieces, all plastic pieces. Oh my God. Um, and that's the, the case of, of the gyre itself, I think, is just sort of shoving it all, like vomiting it up onto this, to the island itself. Yeah. If you look up on anyone who's interested, if they look up on um, Google, even just pictures of Rapa Nui beaches, yeah. it's, it's uh, the plastic pollution is devastating. Yeah. Um, just for every, everyone who's joined, thanks a million for joining. Um, and thanks a million for everyone who's making comments and waving hi to everyone. Um, again, I'm here with Claire McCluskey and we're talking about her voyage um, on the X expedition. And we're talking about her arriving on Rapa Nui, um, the island in the South Pacific. Um, just to give it a little bit of Irish context, Claire, uh, you found an Irish head on the island of heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> see what you did there that was very nice yeah no, that, that was brilliant that was actually that day was so it was quite emotional you know we had just spent two weeks at sea and it was a really it was a tough leg you know like it was full on we had intense weather I mean I thought it was great you know I loved it um, but it was it was you know the the kind of the act of gathering all the like seeing this sort of destruction as well you know there was so many feelings you know to kind of contend mm -hmm. with and then we arrived to Easter Island and I just didn't want to leave the boat and the, the kind of the community that we had built up you probably get a little bit institutionalized and everything but we arrived to Easter Island and had this incredible welcome um uh people kind of came out to us on canoes and a little girl played the ukulele for us and it was really quite moving and then we got on land and I was just really you know wow we're here this is this is really uh, you know this is really too much to take in and then I just sort of randomly started talking to this woman who came up to say hello who um is from Rapa Nui and she was just like are you Irish and I was like yeah and she was like oh I'm from Tipperary and I was like oh my god I'm so far away <laughs> so far away from home this is you can't go anywhere really yeah yeah so she is um uh gabriella hooker after she is a uh, half irish half rapa nui and she has in the last couple of years she moved back out there she grew up in ross cray i think and uh, i think wow. she's now she worked uh, with the national park but i think she's now working in uh, environmental um projects out there so really really interesting mm. person to meet so that was a really yeah, it was. Yeah, it was one of those really special little moments where you're like, "This is this is hilarious," you know. <laughs> Mad. Yeah, and I'm sure loads of people can identify with that. We've all had that Irish, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, moment. It's a particular Irish thing, though, to love that kind of story as well. Because I've told yeah. a few people who aren't Irish, and they're like, "Yeah, that's fine." And I was like, "You don't get it. This is like this is our thing that we like to find. This is very important." <laughs> Um, I was going to ask you, I know Rapa Nui is of Chilean um, dependency. Yeah. Do they have a lot of programs that are tailored towards fixing the plastic? Or, I mean, how are they tackling yeah, the, the so, onslaught? So people like Gabby, um, they just, every week, they just go out and clean, you know, and they, um, no. it's just part of their, um, their, the way that they have to live. They have to be very mindful of their plastic just on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Um, yeah, teams go out every week and they do beach cleans just all the time just non-stop and like for an island you know they actually don't have many beaches a lot of it is kind of rocky edges or cliffs or whatever they only have two or three kind of like actual sandy beaches that you can you know that we would recognize i suppose as beaches mm. and uh and yeah they're just onslaughted all the time so yeah they do regular beach cleans there was a really great shop um called made in rapa nui which um was a, a kind of a really lovely kind of arts and crafts shop selling uh, pieces handmade by local artisans and designers and stuff and the amount of works in that that had incorporated microplastic particles into the pieces themselves it just kind of spoken off a lot about like this is now a material on the island that people are needing to kind of find a way to, to sort of deal with because getting it off the island and everything is just such a it's such a challenge really you know yeah, even for themselves, it's a small island and they produce waste, waste them themselves. Yeah, I can't imagine they have exactly. much room for landfills. Completely. No, everything would have to be shipped back to, to, to mainland yeah. and to South America. Yeah. And, um, but I suppose it's just that thing where, you know, that, that sense of the away, I guess, is that we in Ireland we can we ship these things elsewhere or even just the nature of the currents sometimes washes things away i mean we still see the impacts of it on our beaches here as well and um, it's just not we can we don't maybe have a few more places left to kind of hide from it i suppose rather than on an island that small they're just they can't ignore it you know so it's just yeah it's really front and center for their lives i think that everybody is 
um, that kind of sense of ocean literacy or or even just waste management literacy is already just so high in, in their uh, consciousness because they can't turn away from it, you know. Um, yeah. So it's very much ingrained into how they sell their food even. You know, there's way less, there's just way less waste already, I think, in that kind of uh, community. Um, and can they tell, can you tell when you're aboard the Expo Expedition where the plastic is coming from? Is that so, possible? Uh, at the point where we're gathering pieces, um, it was pretty hard uh, to see where it was coming from uh, in terms of like, it's not recognisable as um, as an object anymore. We were just finding particles, little pieces. But yes, mm. on board, so we had a really um, amazing piece of equipment called an FTIR machine. It's an infrared spec, spec infrared spectrometry. <laughs> Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> infrared <laughs> Winnie's just somewhere shaking her head at me. And I was like, come on, Claire, I trained you in this. Um, really, really great piece of machinery right here that uses infrared technology to like um, to scan the particles and to basically determine what it is, you know. So that'll, it, so in, uh, in Plymouth, uh, the, uh, the team have a huge one of these that they're taking all of this back, uh, all of the, the, the particles that we've gathered, Winnie has taken it all back and is processing it through this machine to log all these different types of particles and where they come from. But we were, we were able to do some of that on board with this um, onboard machine that we had, a slightly smaller version. And it was donated by the... Um, the mission sponsor perk and elmer so uh really really incredible piece of machinery and yeah so we we process mm. quite a few of these particles and uh like the data still hasn't been published yet or anything like that but on our leg alone um we were it was like overwhelmingly the majority of particles was hdpe uh high density polyethylene and that comes from like food uh containers I think some cosmetics, but any of that kind of like rigid plastic, a lot of it is HDP and it's, yes, predominantly kind of food based, um, uh, yeah, containers, plastic. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, out in the kind of the middle of the South Pacific, it was, that seemed to be what we were finding the most of. Um, mm. But that's the stuff as well that can kind of travel distances, you know, uh, to in a way like, um, like all plastic breaks down, it all degrades, uh, mm. But it never goes away; it just gets smaller and smaller. And HDPE being rigid would break down slightly slower than, say, like LDPE, which is the kind of filmy, the light density polyethylene. You know, and it, it probably would be barely mm. perceptible by the time it would reach out there. You know, so it's just a, an indicator, really, of like how far this stuff travels and then how how um, how prevalent it is as well. You know, when yeah. you, when you really that, it to yeah. Be, yeah. I'm um, sorry to get across to you. Um, I was reading a study there by the University of Manchester and they found in the Mediterranean uh, on the ocean floor, on the sea floor, up to 1.9 million plastic pieces per square metre of sea floor. Oh, yeah. You know, that was on the X Expedition uh, website, which I really recommend to anybody to check out mm -hmm. if you're looking up for facts and figures and all the scientific findings that they're having at the moment. Yeah. Um, do you know of any, is there a way of collecting this plastic? Do you know of any way if it's been talked about? Yeah, I'm not. I was, yeah, I was thinking about that over the last few days there. I don't know how many, um, I know that there's various initiatives that kind of use different filters and uh, uh, and there's different kind of technologies that people are constantly trying to develop and um, things that can go in to like scoop in pieces. I don't know definitively what the answer to that is really. Um, the... I think beach cleans are a huge way because an awful lot of stuff gets pushed ashore. Um, yeah. If you beach clean, gather as much as you can up there. But I think the biggest thing is to stop it getting in in the first place. You know, the yeah. the fact that that really stood out for me more than anything else that kind of frightened me really was how insidious the issue is. So mm -hmm. whenever you're like, you know, we kind of think of plastic in the ocean and the gyre as this kind of like floating garbage patch and you just want to go out with a big bag and just bag it all up and take it away you know but yeah, it's not done. really quite as tangible as that i think was the thing that surprised mm -hmm. me you know um there's a growing kind of realization that it's not necessarily just this floating mass it's actually more of a soup where it's just all these particles that are almost invisible that are so distributed like everywhere you know um yeah that it's and then they, when they get so tiny and so microscopic, it's so hard to 
to gather it all uh, it's just so much more everywhere and it's so much more urgent I think than, than we can realize so it's not just a case of getting a really nice big net and sieving everything out because it's ingrained like I saw in those in those trolls it's like embedded into the very you know slimy little creatures that live there that get eaten by the bigger creatures you know so it just it's just in everything you know so sorry make it depressing <laughs> no guys i think i just to add to the depressingness they found uh, microplastics in 150 year old yeah. uh, ocean sediment yeah yeah i think that was a uh, winnie courtney jones the same scientist that was on our mission i think that was one of her papers all right yeah that came out recently and yeah the fact that it was in this they had no idea how it got into those into stuff that old it's i think it's the hypothesis maybe it's like burrowing worms that can kind of that that kind of go up and down through this really old silt that it's actually bringing the kind of plastic pieces down with the into their habitat and stuff that it just gets worked into it so yeah it's really just getting in everywhere so i think the main thing is to just say no <laughs> to plastic yeah. in the first place really you know um mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's, it's just so prevalent and more so now than it ever has been as well. I, I think like you guys do such great kind of awareness raising and discussions around this as well. But like the fact is that the most, I think half the plastic that was ever produced was made in the last 13 years, you know, like that's, I think a really telling statistic as well that it's, it's accelerating the kind of the use of, of it is really shot up Um it is uh, which is really really unnecessary you know um it is there's um i mean just having conversations like this one claire and um you yourself going around and 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 creating awareness mm -hmm. it gets people to think differently about um how we're behaving as customers and consumers yeah. you know yeah. and there's always that you know bottom up uh, changing the culture mm -hmm. it has to come from the top down too we have to change industry you know we have to yeah, yeah. ring our tds and say we don't want single-use plastics you know tell our supermarkets i don't want these fruit and vegetable Good. wrapped in plastics you know um but all of this is helping to create so much great awareness yeah and yeah. um, can i ask you uh, a question claire that i i'm personally interested to ask you um, and yeah. this experience how has it affected you personally and your art or has it yeah. all yeah well um <laughs> attacked yeah so personally i think it's like that i just can't really go anywhere now without seeing it you know and it seems to have mm. sort of it's really annoying actually you know <laughs> it's like i'm kind of aware i think my housemates are very patient with me but i'm kind of getting a little more and more like vocal with them you know i'm just uh, very like every chance that i can now i suppose i'm just it's in my mind where I have to like try and do the right thing, you know, and like step away from, from the plastic option or it's, it's become this thing where I can't really like how I navigate the world has changed. I think completely now mm -hmm. in terms of my work, you know, like I am, um, yeah, there's a lot, there's been a lot to think about since, um, since I came back from that last trip and uh it's definitely feeding into projects that i'm working on now it's still early days i don't really know yet where it's going to go work-wise but just this i think this sense of overwhelming sense of scale of the problem i think is really interesting and something that i'm i'm trying mm -hmm. to get my head around and work with i think a little bit how do we contend with a scale of that size you know it's very overwhelming it's very paralyzing you know and i think mm -hmm that those kind of themes are coming into my work a lot more now and how we might actually um because i think we can see the problem now you know and i think there's lots of great work that deals with looking at the, the problem this mm. is what the plastic looks like this is where it's coming from but how do we actually emotionally reckon with that what does that mean for mm. um the state of our seas you know um yeah. i'm gonna uh, yeah so i'm also i'm collaborating with one of the uh, other sailors on board i think we're both gonna try and and do some research into into that that moment that shift happens you know when you suddenly become aware of the problem and then you start to take an action and what happens in between that like provokes that action you know to take place the, you know there's def I've, I've noticed in myself i was aware of I started to notice plastic everywhere and then there was a like not a, a bit of a wait but there was it took a few times for me to see it before then I started to suddenly take steps in the right direction towards mm. not using it and I'm very interested in that switch so 
I think that's kind of where yeah. I'm going at the moment. And yeah, if anyone is already thinking this way, please get in touch because it'd be so cool to know, like, you know, what, you know, how people are thinking about this, you know, because it's all about encouraging more change, I guess, as well, isn't it? You know, like trying to get people on board with it. And, and it is great, actually, that we're having this conversation that people are, are talking about it yeah. and interested in this kind of thing. Even like four years ago, that was just a totally different story, you know? Yeah. And I, I was actually speaking to a colleague of mine, Angela, who's on there to say, hi, Angela. Um, and we were saying how important artists are um, mm. when, you know, as a culture, as a community, we're trying to get our head around these things, like these crises that we're in, COVID-19, for example, or the plastic crises, and how engaging with the subjects in a completely different way can help you kind of understand your place within it or how you're coming to terms with things. Totally. It's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. huge. It's a huge, a huge subject, you know, but it's, it's really exciting as well. I think even just to see, um, yeah, it just, yeah, it's just, it's so ingrained in, I think, contemporary life as well, you know, and, and I think yeah, what mm -hmm. you were saying earlier about how it has to come from the top down, I suppose we need to be asking, like, mm -hmm. why is it being handed to us and actually yeah. stopping to pay attention, like, questioning why it's there as well, you know, like there are the fact mm -hmm. is that we still don't have a plastic bottle deposit scheme in Ireland, you yeah. know, on the cards. But there are reasons why that hasn't been brought in yet. And uh, and why is that? And who is stopping that from happening? And what is in their interest? You know, and these are all huge questions that go beyond just like bring my own water bottle or whatever. You know, it's 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 just yeah. such a it's such a we need so many more kind of people looking at it as an issue and coming at it from all different angles, I think, you know. And even as an individual, we can make our own personal choices. Like, I really want to talk to you for a second about yeah. Plastic Free July. Yeah. But we can also then demand that change on the top oh. as well, you know, oh, yeah. get our TDs to represent us properly at the same time. Yeah. Have you gone Plastic Free July before? Uh, yeah, so we started doing it with, um, when I was saying when we were living in that house, uh, that was a really lovely time. And yeah, it's, it was like starting to try and refuse things. And this is way back when I was, I suppose, at the start of this awareness growing um and I found it so hard you know and then I was like but I really want you know a bag of crisps and it's in plastic and you suddenly start even just the act of trying even if you fail at it you start to to see all the kind of the cracks and things um now I would try and be as I I yeah the plastic free July thing is a really great challenge to do um yeah but it starts into obviously seep into everyday life and I think that's the whole point right you know it, it kind of you uh, once you go for plastic free July, then you kind of can't really take yourself seriously for the rest of the year. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, I try my best, really. I think now I've kind of um, gotten to the point where you know you can't say like even with trying to cut down on plastic as much as possible. Like I still, mm. we, I still have so much stuff arrives even like in the post or whatever. You know that is wrapped in it. Yeah. I've been trying eco. Yeah you know like collecting it all sequestering it in like bottles maybe for a future project use but I f yeah, yeah. I think my my housemates will be patient with that for so long <laughs> <laughs> is what the spare room is for <laughs> i'm just building a little cabin for myself outside you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're actually going to be doing tips for Plastic Free July uh, yeah. so I might ask you to put together yeah. maybe top five tips for people if that's okay absolutely yeah 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 it's oh, actually really fun kind of when you get into it it's something really satisfying about whittling out when, and when you find an, like mm. you know the water bottle is like a really easy one and then it's like yeah you know a nice biodegradable phone case or whatever you know like there's all these little things yeah. that, are, that, that just add up you know and there's so many shops and, and outlets now that we can go to that are plastic free and yeah. help us out, which is great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you want to talk about or anything else you want to say about the expedition trip or anything? Um, just, I think that there, just keep an eye and uh, apply if you're interested. So obviously they've been uh, like everything put on pause with the whole COVID-19 thing. So um, I think what they're planning on doing is just, um, yeah, so my, I was leg eight and there was a whole other load of other legs to go after me to get the boat the rest of the way around the world. But understandably, they've been paused now. The boat's in Tahiti with the the, cat, the skipper and the first mate. and uh, But they will resume, I think, next year. They'll just pick up where they left off and continue. Uh, 
I would recommend anyone to keep an eye on the X Exhibition website and whenever they are open for applications. Again, they still have some like kind of later legs. Uh, looking, they'll be looking for for crew on that, and I one hundred percent recommend going. You know, you can go for shorter legs. You don't have to go for a full two weeks at sea. There's legs that sometimes are coastal, or they might just be going more like closer to land if you're worried about going really far offshore. But um, yeah. it's it's a really, really, really incredible opportunity. And just the people that you meet and the, the support systems that you then are suddenly entered into. And it's this whole huge network of just really amazing, very energetic and inspiring people. And hands down, really great thing to, to go and involve yourself with. Wow. If anybody's interested, you can check it out on the Expedition uh, Instagram page, which we'll link you to and also uh, their website. Um, okay, I think that's it uh, for yeah. this week's Sick of Plastic Conversations. Thank you so much, Claire. Yeah, no problem. Thanks so much for having me on. It was really nice to talk to you. And we look forward to seeing your top five tips for Plastic Free July, or yeah. 50, you know. <laughs> um, okay, join us next week, and we'll be talking to Sarah Kavna from the Conscious Cook campaign. Thank you, everybody, for getting on board and sending your questions and your comments. It was great to see everyone from me and Claire. Bye. Bye.